Welcome to GBN Live. We, of course, have a wonderful program tonight. We have Brother B.J. Clark and also Brother Don Blackwell and myself will be discussing the work of the Holy Spirit. We hope that you'll stay tuned and we hope that you will be with us for this study. Live from the Gospel Broadcasting Network located just outside of Memphis, Tennessee. Be a part of today's episode by calling in or interacting with us through Facebook. Now from Olive Branch, Mississippi, it's GBN Live. Good evening. We are glad you could join us tonight for GBN Live. Our regular host, uh, Brother Mike Hickson, is out sick tonight, and I'm privileged to be able to fill in for him. I'm Don Blackwell, the Executive Director of the Gospel Broadcasting Network, and I have here with me tonight two brethren who have been on the program several times. We have Brother B.J. Clark, who is the Director of the Memphis School of Preaching, and we have Brother Gary Colley, who works with the Get Well Church of Christ and also is the Director of the uh, Spiritual Sword Lectureship. So, gentlemen, thank you for being here with us tonight. Thanks for us. Thank you. We're going to be talking about a subject tonight about which there is a great deal of confusion. Not only in the religious world as a whole, but I believe even within our brotherhood there is a lot of confusion over this subject. We're going to be talking tonight about the subject of the Holy Spirit. And we've got some good questions that have been turned in and we will be covering those tonight. Uh, by way of introduction, I want to say a few things about this to kind of to ease us into this subject. Sometimes when you talk about the subject of the Holy Spirit, you'll hear someone reference it being known as pneumatology. That is pneumatology with a, a silent P on the beginning. The reason that it is known as this is because the Greek word for spirit in the Holy Spirit is from the Greek word pneuma. And so pneumatology is the study of the spirit. Now, this particular Greek word is sometimes translated as wind, sometimes it is translated as breath, sometimes it is translated as spirit, and because of these other possible translations, it has led some people to have some very strange, some very unusual, and you might even say some crazy beliefs about the Holy Spirit. In the day and age in which we live, many people believe they have direct communication from the Holy Spirit. People frequently will desire uh, direct communication, direct feelings, nudgings, leadings from the Holy Spirit. Uh, those in the world who are Calvinist by nature, they believe, of course, that uh, man was born totally hereditarily depraved. They believe that when Adam sinned in the garden, that Adam's sin has been passed on to all men so that we are born depraved. And they believe that the Holy Spirit has to come into a man and, and renew him, regenerate him so that uh, he can be right with God. And even in the Lord's church today, we have many that are saying some strange things and believe they have direct guidance from the Holy Spirit. And so a very, very crucial subject that we're going to talk about tonight. And I think we have two men that are very, very qualified to discuss this this evening. Now the first thing I want to talk about as we uh, discuss the Holy Spirit tonight is the fact that the Holy Spirit is God. As we begin to address this, the reason I even bring this up is because we have many in the religious world that uh, would deny that. Of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses would say that uh, the Holy Spirit is not God, that uh, the Holy Spirit is just an, an emanation. Um, can, can the two of you share some passages with us, share, share some wisdom from the Bible to prove that the Holy Spirit is indeed God? Well, He's always spoken of in the third person masculine gender. It is never spoken of as it, but as He. And of course, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is a plural term. And in Genesis 1.26, He said, Let us make man in our own image. Now, the New Testament tells us about the Godhead and that God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit make up the Godhead. And they are all divine. In other words, they have no beginning and no ending. And they are eternal. They are absolutely divine in every way. Um, probably Brother B.J. might give you another verse or two on that. Right. Uh, in addition to those excellent comments, I'm reminded of Acts 5 where the Bible says that uh, Peter says to Ananias, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep back part of the price of the land? And then in verse 4 he says, While it remained, was it not thine own? After it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Ask him why he had conceived this thing in his heart. And then he says, Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. But he'd already said that he'd lied to the Holy Spirit. But now he says, You've lied unto God, therefore 
according to Peter's own declaration and Luke's recording thereof, uh, the Holy Spirit is, is God. Right. He possesses the nature of God. In fact, in thinking about this program, I saw something on Facebook that uh, someone had posted, and I, I wrote it down. I certainly won't say the name of the person, but it struck me here. The person said, I am thankful for the Holy Spirit and how it empowers me. Mm -hmm. And I thought, we've got to get away from that language. That's right. And it brought some passages to my mind, like John 16, 13, Jesus mm -hmm. speaking. He says, however, he says, however, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak of His own authority, but whatsoever He hears, He will speak. And so the Lord emphasizes over and over again, as Brother Colley mentioned, that the Holy Spirit is referred to not as a He, not as an emanation, but... Uh, as an individual, mm -hmm. uh, a masculine individual as is referred to there. And you know, I was just thinking in connection with that, I don't lie, I cannot lie to this table. This table is incapable of receiving information. It's an inanimate object, it's an it. But I can lie to a person and to lie to the Holy Spirit is to lie to a divine person. Right, as it was cited in Acts 5. Right. In fact, I made some notes of some things uh, in reference to the Holy Spirit along the lines of what you're saying to appreciate uh, the personage of the Holy Spirit. Uh, people seem to, to uh, appreciate that God the Father has personage. Right. And God the Son has personage. But the Holy Spirit, they seem to want to treat as an it. And so Romans 8, 27 indicates the Holy Spirit has a mind. Uh, the Holy Spirit speaks, John 16, 13. He teaches, John 14, 26. He testifies, Acts 20, 23. He bears witness, John uh, 15, 26. With uh, respect to personal relations, he can be grieved, Isaiah 63, 10. He can be vexed, Acts 5, 16. Uh, he can be tested, Acts 5 and 9. And so uh, we can go on with passages like that, but to show that he has the characteristics uh, of an individual, and uh, that is uh, very important that we appreciate that. I think it's interesting to note, too, that Jesus had a mission. It says he came into the world to seek and save the lost. Many people don't know what the Holy Spirit's mission is. That's right. Some of them think it is for him to provide them money right. or provide them some kind of direct guidance. They don't want to read the Bible, even though that's where the Spirit speaks to us. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 through 11, he said, But I have not seen, nor either ear heard, the things which God prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man that is in him? And even so the things of God knoweth no man, save the spirit of God. Now John 16, 8 says, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he's going to convict the world in respect of sin, of righteousness, and of the judgment. That was his mission. That's right. A lot of people never have learned that. And I think a lot of this confusion is because people don't understand the role of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. I heard someone describe it uh, this way with reference to the scheme of redemption. They said, the Father wrought it, mm -hmm. the Son bought it, and the Holy Spirit taught it. And so the role of the Holy Spirit is the revealer, the teacher That's right. of the message. And when you understand that, a lot of these other things uh, do go away. Yes, they do. Um, I want to bring out some more things, but for the sake of time, let's go to some of these questions because um, I know when people turn questions in and we don't answer them, that's very frustrating. So um, we have this question, and uh, Brother Kali, uh, let me uh, ask you what you think about this. The person says, I thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. After trying to explain the verses speaking about the Holy Spirit as stated in Mark 16, 17 through 20, I often feel as if I do, do not do a good job. I would like to see if one of the panelists would discuss how they would deal with such. And so Mark 16, 17 through 20, particularly mm -hmm. with reference to the, the role of the Holy Spirit, uh, can uh, you share some enlightenment, enlightenment this, with us on that? Well, I'll certainly try. This is following the Great Commission as given by Jesus to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall also accompany them that believe. In my name shall they cast out demons. They shall uh, speak with other tongues. They shall take up serpents, and it shall not hurt them, or drink deadly things. It shall in no wise hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, there are two things that I notice here. First of all, there's no specified time given for these, thing, these signs to follow these. And there's no specified persons as to whom they're going to follow. 
But we know who they followed. They only followed the apostles. And the apostles did these things so that they could confirm the Word of God. And so he says here, send the Lord shows that Jesus spoke with them and received up into heaven. He sat down at the right hand of God. But they went forth preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the Word by signs that followed them. All right, I know who they followed then. They followed the apostles. In Hebrews 2, 1 through 4, he said, we ought to give them earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we let them drift away from us. For if the word spoken by angels uh, and every transgression had received a just recompense and reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, watch it now, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, both with signs and wonders and manifold deeds and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So that's the purpose of these miraculous signs. And when the word was confirmed, they were no longer needed. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, that though tongues may have been here, they have ceased. The prophecies and so forth that had to be uh, brought by these uh, supernatural powers, they ceased because that which was perfect was come, and that, of course, was the law of God. Right. Thank you very much. Well said. This individual has a second question. He says one more question, and uh, BJ, if you don't mind um, uh, dealing with this question, he says, if an individual has obeyed the gospel and after baptism receives the gift of the Holy Spirit, but later falls away back into the world, does the Holy Spirit leave this person? Okay. Um, I guess my mind was uh, on something else here. Uh, and my, I may need to ask you to repeat that to me because I was Would thinking... Would you like to read it again? Yes, okay. um, yes sir. Uh, um, in fact, if you had a thought, do you want to hit that me, before we move on? Let me say that before I okay. clear my mind of that. Brother Colley's excellent comment reminded me that it has always been that way with reference to the confirmation of the Word. Moses and Elijah and Christ all appeared on the mount together, and of course Christ was superior, but there was an absolute explosion of miraculous activity with Moses. And what's the reason, Exodus 4, 5, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared unto thee. And then Elijah came and was able to do great miracles and even raise a widow's son from the dead. And she said, now by this I know that you're, the word you've spoken is true and from God. And so, and then Nicodemus says to Jesus in John 3, 2, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God because why? No man can do the miracles or signs that you're doing except God be with him. And so this confirmation process was uh, in my mind in connection with what Brother Colley said. Now, were you asking about the gift of the Spirit and what was read there? I'm no, sorry, me, I missed let me that. Let read the question again. Yes. This is the same person that asked the previous question. Okay. Right. He says, if an individual has obeyed the gospel and after baptism receives the gift of the Holy Spirit, but later falls away and goes back into the world, does the Holy Spirit then leave that person? Okay. Now, this is an excellent question and certainly takes us to Acts chapter 2 where they were told to repent and be baptized every one of them in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Uh, they were told they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now this has been uh, understood in various ways across the years. In some ways, uh, in different ways, but not in a threatening uh, doctrinally concerning matter, but other ways some have gone too far with it. Let me illustrate what I mean. Uh, when I first read this passage years ago as a student in college, I wondered what it meant when it talked about uh, they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I read a book, and uh, I called my dad. I remember this vividly. I called him up. I said, I didn't even know the Holy Spirit was living inside of me. And he said, well, wait a minute. What have you been reading? And I told him, and he said, let me recommend to you that you read another book and use the Bible as your final guide. But he mentioned reading uh, Brother Camp's book on the work of the Holy Spirit in redemption, which I noticed you have a copy of near you. And once I read that, uh, and then I read something Brother Robert R. Taylor Jr. wrote in a book called What Do You Know About the Holy Spirit? And I was personally convinced that uh, the Holy Spirit certainly was not dwelling in me personally in any literal, absolute, personal sense and that uh, the meaning of the text for those folks on the day of Pentecost, one of the things Brother Taylor brought out so well in my judgment 
and some differ with this and that's okay as long as they don't go too far with what they teach about uh, the Holy Spirit living in us and doing things to us and things of that nature. But uh, he argued that when these people hearing this on that day considered the nature of the Holy Spirit activity they'd seen that day, it was all miraculous. And so what would their understanding have been of the reception of the Holy Spirit? It would have been uh, a miraculous anticipation. To, in my judgment, that beautifully dovetails with Mark 16, where these people could go. They didn't have the luxury of going into communities and saying, everyone open up your Bible to and confirming the word with scripture following, such as we to do today, but they could uh, show the signs that were imparted unto them by the miraculous uh, laying on of hands of the apostles. Only the apostles could do it. And uh, so, and that by the way means once the last apostle died and once the last person died that had this miraculous activity, there is no way to pass it on. Uh, but the gift of the Holy Spirit here uh, is not necessarily received in an automatic way, although some have taken the position that it, it, that it is received in a non-miraculous way, but uh, certainly one would, uh, one would not be able to prove any kind of uh, reception of the Spirit that leads them to any kind of miraculous ability. Acts chapter 8 when they'd heard the, that they'd been baptized, but the Spirit had fallen upon none of them. If, again, this was a revelation to me in my college days that I now appreciate more than I did even then, if the Holy Spirit is automatically given to someone at the moment of their baptism, then the folks in Acts 8 had been baptized, yet the Spirit had not fallen upon them, thus showing that this idea that the Holy Spirit is automatically given at baptism is simply not a biblical uh, concept. In fact, let me say a word about that because we might have viewers that are watching this. The essence of this question comes down to what is the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38? And I have seen brethren sometimes even get heated about this, and I certainly don't think this is a fellowship issue. I remember when I was in the school of preaching that one of the instructors held the position that the gift of the Holy Spirit uh, is salvation. And I know some good brethren that I love deeply who hold that position, and I certainly have no problem fellowshipping them. Uh, I personally uh, believe along what I believe Brother B.J. is saying, that the gift of the Holy Spirit uh, relates to the miraculous uh, for several reasons. In Acts chapter 2, when um, the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they began to speak in tongues and the question was asked, what is this? Peter said, this is that which was spoken to the prophet Joel, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. When you get to Acts chapter 10 and you see uh, Cornelius' household, we're told in verse 45 that uh, it was poured out on them, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why did they recognize that? Because they were speaking in tongues. When you get to Acts chapter 19, we're told that uh, this group of individuals here, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, laid his hands upon them and they received the Holy Ghost and then they spoke in tongues. And so we could go through some other passages, but uh, I do want to say this is not, uh, I, I think, a point of fellowship. It's certainly nothing that should be uh, the cause of contention between us. In fact, Brother Colley, you might have some thoughts to, to offer about that. We haven't asked you what you think about this. <laughs> well, you don't want to because okay. I might disagree with okay. you. <laughs> In John 4.10, we mm -hmm. have the gift of God. Mm -hmm. Spoken to the woman at the well. The gift of God was salvation. Mm -hmm. In Ephesians 3 and verse 4, or 4 and verse 7, I'm sorry, we have the gift of Christ spoken of. Salvation. That's what it was. And then in Acts 2.38, he says, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you, it's unto your children, it's unto all of them that are far off. What promise? Well, the promise that was made to Abraham that in him and his seed should all the families of the earth be blessed. I've often thought that the best commentary on any verse is the Bible itself. And if you go to the next sermon in Acts 3.19, there is the same preacher preaching on the same subject and telling the same thing. And he says, repent. That's what Acts 2.38 said, repent. And turn again, or be baptized, that your sins may be blotted out, that you might be forgiven of sin and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He said, so that seasons of refreshing might come into your life. Well, that is the gift of the Holy Spirit because salvation brings the seasons of refreshing. Now, that may not be 
exactly what everybody thinks. It's what I think. And, right. And, and so in that's fact, a, what you're saying beautifully illustrates what I was just saying, right. and that is Correct. we've got brethren that uh, have views. In fact, it was interesting. I was having a flashback of Brother Curtis Cates because yes. he taught uh, the same thing. I was hearing his words echo in my head as you were saying that. And this is not something that brethren should be divided over. Oh, no, um, no, no. Because in fact, those who take the position that I mentioned, like Brother Taylor and others, would suggest the only reason that that was done and that those miraculous gifts were given to first century Christians is so that those seasons of refreshing could be brought to hearers who needed to hear the gospel in a way that was credible and believable and confirmable, if you'll. And so that is uh, certainly there's there's no disparity of of a, a purpose here. We, we're all ending up in the same place. Absolutely. Right. And right. it was a confirmation of the church and the salvation that was going to be there. And right. so uh, I certainly don't think this is problematic. In fact, um, we it's uh, time for us to take a break. But after the break, I want for us to talk a little bit more because there are some things that relate to the Holy Spirit that are not matters of fellowship. But then again, there are some things that are crucial right. and yes. that are matters of salvation. Right. And we've got to know where to properly draw that line. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, we're going to go to a break and we will be back with you in just a minute. Hello, I'm Don Walker, the director of the Southwest School of Bible Studies in Austin, Texas. The Apostle Paul said that we have a responsibility to take the gospel to the lost. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, he said, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Does the word of God burn in your bones? Do you desire to take the gospel to a lost world, to bring souls unto God so that he might be glorified? We have a setting that can help equip you to proclaim the word of God. We focus upon the word of God Textual studies, we study every book, every chapter, and every verse of every book. We also have classes that will help you study God's Word, hermeneutic classes. We have apologetic classes that will equip you to defend the faith. We have preaching classes that will polish your skills so you don't get in the way of the proclamation of the Word of God. We have a practicum that we uh, have as far as a class that will help prepare you to leave school and enter into a work and try to do that in a seamless way so that you're prepared to go and to labor among the brethren and to work in the kingdom of, of heaven. If you have a desire to proclaim God's word, if you want to work with God's people on a daily basis to affect the souls of men and to affect eternity, we can assist you. Give us a call at the Southwest School of Bible Studies in Austin, Texas. Thank you for tuning in to GBN Live. If you have a question related to tonight's topic that you would like to have answered, please call 888-805-3390. That's 888-805-3390. You can also email us at gbnlive at gbntv.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us live each week. You can send your questions through Facebook in the comments section, and we will do our best to get them answered on the air. Now back to the program. We are back. We are glad that you have stayed tuned. If you're just now tuning in, we're talking tonight about the subject of the Holy Spirit. And I'm told we have a caller on the line at this time, and so we would like to go to our caller. His name is Roger Leonard. Roger, are you there? I'm here, brother. Hey, uh, Brother Roger. How I are know. you tonight? I'm doing great. Doing great. How are you, brethren, tonight? Great, great. What's on your mind tonight? I know you may get to this before the program's over, and if you're going to discuss it, that's fine. But I've been having some discussions of late, even with some <clears throat> some of our preaching brethren, about the Holy Spirit helping us in our understanding of Scripture. And some have even gone so far as to say that, well, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit helps you understand Scripture. What's curious to me is that they would reference, like, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 14 and 15, mm -hmm. 
and then even going to uh, some of them going to Jesus' discussion with the apostles in John 14, 15, and 16. And my understanding is that, you know, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it's very clear that the scriptures help us know what God wants us to do. It'll make the man of God, they'll make the man of God complete. So my question that I would like for you brothers to address is, does the Holy Spirit help us understand Scripture? And if he does, how? And if he doesn't, why not? And um, because some among our brethren are even saying these things, and I don't believe they're supported by Scripture, and I would just appreciate it if you all would address that. Okay, well, thank you very much, Roger. We appreciate the call. We're going to let you go, and then we're going to uh, seek to answer uh, your call the best we can. Thank you. Good to talk to you tonight. Thank you. Good night. All right. We actually were going to talk about some of this later, but since he's asked, we'll just jump right into some of this now. Uh, Roger has asked the question about the Holy Spirit helping us in understanding the Scripture, and he referenced to 1 Corinthians 2, uh, I think he said 14 and 15, if I recall. And we had a question tonight that was turned in that uh, referenced 1 Corinthians. In fact, I'll go ahead and read this because it goes along with it. It says, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 12 says that the Holy Spirit helps us understand how does this work. And he said, some brethren are saying that the Holy Spirit helps us understand. And he cited 1 Corinthians 2, I guess 12 through 16. Um, so, uh, BJ, would you like to address sure. that? Uh, the whole context of 1 Corinthians 2 is addressing how we know what we know about God's scheme of redemption. And the point Paul is making here when he says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for them that love Him, means that none of our natural senses would ever be able to detect and determine God's scheme of redemption apart from God's choice to reveal it to us by means of the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean He does that to us individually because the Holy Spirit revealed holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. And so when he writes these things in 1 Corinthians 2, he is suggesting the benefit we have is that the Holy Spirit has taught things in spiritual words, the American Standard Version says, thus meaning His revelation as given in this book right here is the means whereby we will get the truth. The natural man, the senses of man could never receive these things without direct, uh, without a, uh, without a uh, divine is the word I'm looking for, divine revelation to mankind by means of inspired authors. Do you, do you think it would be correct to say it this way that um, the Holy Spirit helps us understand the mind of God in the first century in the sense that he revealed it miraculously. Today He helps us in the sense that what was revealed was written down. That's how He helps us understand it. He revealed the mind of God that was written for us. Not It, it doesn't say directly or indirectly that He's guiding us or influencing us in some way to understand that which is written. Right. I had a friend in Houston, Texas, and he said he could just pull out beside the road and open his Bible, and the Holy Spirit helped him understand all of it. Well, the Holy Spirit never promised that. This verse 12 doesn't promise that. He's talking about a contrast between the worldly person, as Brother B.J. pointed out, and the spiritual person who studies the Bible. Now, when we see Romans 1, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. And he said, therein is revealed the righteousness of God from faith unto faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so we don't live by our own thinking, we live by faith. But faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. The Spirit gives us these things, and He says, Be not foolish, Ephesians 5, 17, but understand what the Holy Spirit saith. And when He records in Revelation 2 and 3, He said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Those were the things He had written in these letters. And so that's the way the Holy Spirit acts with us. He brings us the truth, and uh, we understand it because he, of His teaching. Now, the second part he had to the, did you have something to add? BJ? I was just thinking, Don, what do you do when two people both claim to have received the message they believe in, 
as a result of the Holy Spirit revealing it to them. If you ask the Mormons how you know the Book of Mormon is from God, they'll tell you to pray about it and the Holy Spirit will tell you it's from God. If you ask the Unification Church members, followers of Sun Young Moon, how to know that divine principle which they claim is written by him, the third Adam is from God, they tell you to pray about it, the Holy Spirit will tell you. So I had some of these guys in my office one time and I said, what if I told you the Holy Spirit told me to tell you when you got here that you're wrong? And they were bamboozled by that idea, the very idea. And I said, look, my point is anyone can claim that the Spirit has revealed something to them and this leaves us in a sea of subjectivity. But when you can go to the Word of God and see what He actually wrote and just go by what He wrote. And when you read, you may understand, Paul said in Ephesians right. 3, 4, we can all understand what the Scriptures teach, what the Spirit taught. Absolutely. Now the second part, so we don't ignore um, his question, but answer it thoroughly. He said, some brethren are referencing John 14, 16 as evidence that the Holy Spirit um, helps us to understand today. Of course, John 14, 16, Jesus said, I will pray the Father that He will give you another comforter uh, that... Uh, he may abide with you forever. If I were trying to take that position, I wouldn't have chosen that verse. I wouldn't I, either. <laughs> I probably would have gone on to verse 26 maybe, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, uh, the Father will send in my name and He will teach you all things. I, I might would have chosen that one. Right. But um, uh, Brother Colley, can you address uh, the problem with this thinking that John 14 is teaching that the Holy Spirit helps us understand today? Jesus, of course, was the Comforter to these apostles. But He said, I'm going to have to go away. And I'm going to send you another comforter who will, of course, help you and guide you. That comes from the word paraclete, which means orphans. And he wouldn't leave them orphans. He wanted them to have guidance. That's the reason John 14, 15, and 16 all say, he's going to bring all things to your remembrance. He's going to teach you all things. And he's going to guide you into all truth. And so this is where we get the truth and this is where we get the Spirit's message and this is where we get the understanding. And Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And you said something that I think was very key there about John 14. You said, Jesus said this to the apostles. That's right. This was spoken to the apostles. That's this right. was not a promise for all men, no. uh, for all time. This was something specifically said to them. But something that I think is very interesting in the next verse Jesus promised, uh, Jesus was their comforter. He said, I'm going to be leaving you. But He said, the Father will send another That's comforter. Right. But this is what's interesting because in verse 17, He says, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Now, I've heard people say a lot of things about that, but it's interesting this word receive can literally mean to take away. I believe that what He's saying in this passage is, I'm here with you now as your comforter. Mm -hmm. I'm about to be taken away. I'm going to be crucified. But I'm going to send another comforter whom the world cannot take away. And that perhaps that is the very message of, of comfort that he's giving them. But the key in, in answer to what uh, Roger asked is this wasn't written to all men everywhere. This was specifically to the apostles. And I think we always need to remember, if we don't want to be confused, John 14, 15, and 16, as you said, were all written to the apostles. That's right. But a lot of people take it to themselves personally, and that's not to be done. We're not promised those things which the apostles were promised. And it's interesting, John 14, 26, when the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, shall come, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things whatsoever I have said unto you. The people that I've talked to today uh, that claim that the Holy Spirit is guiding them. I'm sure you've, you've had similar things, but I have sat in Bible studies and they will say, well, the Holy Spirit uh, said so and so. And I will say, oh, where is that in the Bible? Mm -hmm. And they will say, uh, well, I don't know. And I've sometimes, I will tell them where the reference is and that'll happen again. And, and they'll say, I don't know. And I'll tell them where the reference is. And I've said, you know, it's interesting. You say the Holy Spirit's guiding you directly. I say He's not guiding me. I know where it is and you don't. <laughs> and that's an obvious problem because if the Holy Spirit is guiding them, He will bring to your remembrance all things and you wouldn't have this recollection problem. That's right. right. And uh, also there He said, all things that I've spoken unto you, you apostles. Jesus hasn't spoken anything directly to that's me right. or you or anyone listening. And so He's obviously talking to people that He'd spoken to directly and how Brother Wallace used to say there's a reminding office of the Spirit and a revealing office. He would reveal things not yet revealed. He would remind them of things already revealed. That's not happening today. That's right. 
We have another question I want to get to. This was uh, submitted by Chris Letson. He says, can you please comment on Romans chapter 8 and verse 11? Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. Uh, BJ, would you like to comment on that passage? In fact, why don't we read it and then, then we'll comment on it. Do you already have it? Yes, sir. Would you like to read it and comment sure, on that? It, it reads, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Uh, I've always learned and remembered to appreciate the emphasis here. There's a difference between the fact of the Spirit's indwelling and the how of the indwelling. Correct. To deny that the Spirit indwells us would be to deny Scripture. The, the statement, the question really is, how does He do it? And in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, Paul said, be filled with the Spirit. Now that's interesting in and of itself because if you're automatically a recipient of the Holy Spirit, upon your baptism, then why would you have to be commanded to be filled with something that God already gave you at baptism? But the inspired commentary on Ephesians 5.18 as to how you can be filled with the Spirit is Colossians 3.16. The Colossian epistle and Ephesians are always compared to, uh, are mentioned as uh, those which are so comparable in their content. And this is, uh, Brother Colley mentioned earlier, best commentary on the Word is the Word itself. How is one filled with the Spirit? Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Well, the Word of Christ was revealed by the Holy Spirit. He said as much. Jesus said, He shall take of mine and show it to you, apostles, John 16. And so they wrote it down. And we have the Spirit dwelling in us insofar as the Word He provided guides us and lives within us. Someone says, I can see your Father in you. What do they mean by that? They can see characteristics of my Father that are in me, but that doesn't uh, mean that there's my, my Father's literal person is in me in the same way. Uh, when Dr. J first came into the NBA, uh, when Michael Jordan, rather, first came into the NBA, people said he's the second coming of Dr. J. What did that mean? He looked a lot like him, acted a lot like him. Well, when I go by this book, I'm going to look a lot like Christ wants me to look. In fact, I'll always be what Christ wants me to be if I'm following this. Uh, the only time I'm not is when I'm not following this. But the Spirit is the one giving the Word to show us how to do that. Very excellent. I, I love the parallel, Ephesians 5. Be filled with the Spirit, Colossians 3, let the Word dwell in you, telling us exact two parallel passages, right. telling us how the Spirit dwells in us. That's correct. And that, uh, as he pointed out, that is a command. I mean, you must obey that. That's right. But somebody says, well, how can I be filled with the Spirit? And he just gave that answer from Colossians 3, be filled with the Spirit. Dr dr let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. So those things mesh together. Where If you're honest, you can't miss that. In fact, this is a good segue into the next segment I actually wanted to discuss, and that is the question, how does the Holy Spirit dwell in us? None of us would question, none of us would dispute the fact that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. The That's Bible right. teaches that. Sometimes um, those who believe the Spirit dwells through the Word, people will accuse them saying, you don't believe in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, such is not accurate. We do believe in the indwelling of the Spirit. The question is how. Now, I have heard three stances over the years um, and I'm going to go through these, and I want to say this as well. How the Holy Spirit indwells us should not necessarily be a point of fellowship either if a person keeps it within uh, a proper realm. Now, let me uh, cite some of these. Number one, some people believe the Holy Spirit literally indwells us. They believe in the literal indwelling, but that the Holy Spirit does nothing. Uh, if a person believes that position, that the Holy Spirit literally indwells us. They take Acts 2, 38 and 39, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and they believe the gift of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit Himself. Right. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you, but He does nothing. Is that a problematic belief? I think it is. Okay. Because that makes foolishness the work of the Spirit. Okay. Now, when He came into the world, He was to convict the world, as I mentioned in the beginning, in respect of sin, because they were sinners, of righteousness, that was the righteousness of Christ which they had not accepted, and of that judgment which was to come, which all of us are going to enter into. And I, I agree. I think that would be inconsistent with the character of God. That's right. I would not draw a line of fellowship with a brother who believes the Spirit literally dwells in him, but does not uh, do anything. If he, if he begins to cross the line into, he's guiding me or doing something miraculous, 
uh, then I'd have a problem with that. That's the first view. Here's the second view. Literal indwelling, but he does something. Certainly that's going to be unscriptural because now you have the Holy Spirit doing something separate and apart from the Word. BJ, you want right. to comment on that? <laughs> sure. Uh, in fact, one individual that told me that he had the Holy Spirit literally living inside him, in, of him and, and guiding and governing him was so ugly in his attitude toward me and because I didn't agree with him that uh, I ended up saying to him, now you say that the Spirit is in you making you more like uh, you know He wants you to be. Well, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians <laughs> chapter 5, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, I mentioned all the things that are listed there, and I said, you're resisting the Spirit apparently because <laughs> He's not doing these things in you because you're not manifesting those characteristics. And so the truth of the matter is, uh, He does those things to us in the same way that a man chops down a tree with an ax. The man still chopped the tree down, even though the axe was his instrument. The man gets credit for having chopped the tree down because the axe is never going to do it by itself. The Spirit accomplishes in us, through His sword, uh, the Word of God, the things that we need. And when He does it through the Word, He's still doing it. Right. He's just using this as His medium, His instrument by which He accomplishes that. Absolutely. So we've got one view that is the literal indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but He does nothing, which I personally believe, I, I, like I said, I, I wouldn't draw a line of fellowship, but I don't think that's consistent with the character of God. Why would God do that? Secondly, the literal indwelling, but He does something. That is very problematic, I think is unscriptural. The yes. third view is that the Bible says that the Spirit does dwell us, and He does that via the Word of God. Um, Brother Kyler, would you like to say something about that? We're going to have to take a break here in just a minute, but I wanted to finish this thought. Romans 8 uh, points out that all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Only the ones who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Now, how does the Spirit lead us? Well, what they need to do, and they miss sometimes, is the first two verses of Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, watch it, this is going to describe them, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Absolutely. Now watch it. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. That's the way we're guided by the Spirit, the law of the Spirit of life. And as Brother uh, B.J. pointed out a moment ago, when that law dwells in us, we produce the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. If you don't produce it, you're, you're just speaking a lie. That's right. Because fact, you don't uh, really have the Spirit. I'll mention this before we go to the break. I have a chart that I put together years ago that compares what the Holy Spirit does to what the Word does. Mm -hmm. For instance, the Holy Spirit instructs, Nehemiah 9 and verse 30, the Word instructs, 2 Timothy 3, 12 through 17. The Holy Spirit quickens, John 6, 63, the Word quickens, Psalm 119, verse 50, and it goes on. I've got about 30 of these references to show the things that the Bible says the Spirit does. It also says that the Word does, showing us that's how the Spirit does this. That's, that's why correct. Ephesians 6, 17 refers to the Word of God as the sword of the Spirit. Correct. Well, we need to take a break. Uh, we will be back in about a minute and a half. We hope you will join us again at that time. Hello, this is Heath Stapleton from the Brown Trail School of Preaching. Do you know that we have a Spanish department here in Fort Worth, Texas, training Hispanic brethren throughout the brotherhood here in the United States and the world to become preachers? So if you would like to attend or want some information about this Spanish school of preaching here, please check out our website at www.browntrailschoolofpreaching.com. GBN Live is brought to you by Churches of Christ. If you have any thoughts or concerns about tonight's content, please write to us at 8900 Germantown Road, Olive Branch, Mississippi, 38654. Our email address is gbnlive at gbntv.org. Feel free also to call us at 888-805-3390. 
To view past episodes of GBN Live, visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash user forward slash GBN TV. Just search for Gospel Broadcasting Network and don't forget to click subscribe for updates on new episodes and to see when GBN goes live. GBN is also available on Roku, Apple TV, iPhone, iPad, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. To find out more, visit GBNTV.org. We are back and we're talking tonight about the subject of the Holy Spirit and we've had some great discussion tonight and we've also had some very excellent questions. If you would like to join us tonight, you can certainly call into the program and ask your question live on the air. You can email us at info at gbntv.org or you can join us on Facebook and you can post your question and we will be happy to include it uh, in tonight's discussion and uh, we'd be delighted to have you be a part of the program. I want to read uh, a couple of more questions that we have. This one was turned in by James Craven and he says, I really hope you discuss Franklin Camp's book, The Work of the Holy Spirit in Redemption. It is the only view of the work, when, how, then and now of the Holy Spirit that makes sense and is consistent. And so uh, James Craven is speaking very highly of that book and we had that one turned in before we went on the air tonight and I happen to have a copy of it and so I did get it and bring it with me tonight. Uh, I think this is an absolutely excellent book. In fact, I have several books on the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is absolutely my favorite. Uh, Brother Franklin Camp took the position in this book that any time that you read about the Holy Spirit in the, in the New Testament, that it's uh, referencing basically in one of two ways. It is either the Holy Spirit working through the Word or it was the miraculous workings of the Holy Spirit as took place in the first century and ended in the first century. And I gleaned a lot from that and I think he's right about that. And when I look at passages now, I, I look at it in that way and try to understand it and I think it is exactly what the New Testament uh, teaches. Uh, I'm sure both of you are familiar with this, this book, are you not? Surely. Do you have any thoughts about it since he asked, uh, uh, referenced it tonight? I absolutely do. Uh, it's the book I mentioned earlier that I read right after reading. Okay. A book that uh, claimed the Holy Spirit was living inside of me personally. And I was a college you know, student trying to figure it all out. And my dad said, look, you know, don't take any man's book as a substitute for the book but read that and see what you think and just call me back and give me your honest assessment. That book so clearly uh, showed me the error of my thinking the first time that uh, I used it. And I don't necessarily uh, endorse every single aspect of uh, every single position. For example, I think in Acts 2.39, the promise there referenced is the promise of salvation. Uh, I think Brother Camp would probably have disagreed with that and said it was more of a reference to the miraculous gifts of the Spirit that would be going on in the New Testament age. And I do accept the first part of the, of the premise that they needed that to show people how to be saved in a credible way. But I, I do believe the promise in Acts 2.39 is salvation. However, uh, one can uh, certainly profit greatly in my judgment from reading that book. One of the things I really appreciate about this book, frequently when I'm talking to people about the Holy Spirit, I will hear them reference uh, a literal indwelling and the fact the Holy Spirit is in them. Uh, maybe the Holy Spirit is guiding them. And the passages they go to are passages that I'm absolutely convinced reference the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit in the first century. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that's good about this book is in the back, he actually has um, a scripture index and when a person references one of these scriptures, you can look it up and turn to it and look at his thoughts on them. And uh, as you said, I, I wouldn't agree 100% of the time, but to the vast majority of the time I do. And so I think it's a very, very good book. Absolutely. And um, I don't know if it's in print anymore, do you? I don't know for sure about it, but I know one thing for sure. Any book written by man, <laughs> you better prove it. That's right. That's and right. Uh, be sure the Bible is your final authority. And I'm glad you said that because I wouldn't want anyone to get the idea that we're saying that this is the uh, source of authority on this no. because uh, certainly the Bible is. Any book written by a man, uh, regardless of how much we respect him, um, is still a man. Still a man. I think maybe one <laughs> verse that confuses people is Acts 5.32. We're witnesses of these things and so also is the Holy Spirit 
whom God hath given to them that obey Him. And a lot of people say, see, everybody receives the Holy Spirit when they obey. Wait a minute now. You need to always decide who it's speaking to and what it's speaking about. So this is talking about the apostles being witnesses. And he says, so is the Holy Spirit. Now the mouth of two or more witnesses, the thing is established. But if you'll notice the language here, he didn't say God giveth to all who obey, but who God hath given. That was to the apostles. They had already received those things. It wasn't to all of us today. That's right. And I think that maybe will help some people. I think that, that's along an that excellent line. thought. Uh, we've got another question that I was wanting to get to tonight. Uh, this one references Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 28. It says, Romans 8, 26 through 28 references the Holy Spirit making intercession for the saints during their prayers. What does this passage mean? Can you help me to understand it? Uh, why don't we read that passage and then um, we'll make some uh, observations about it. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself, the uh, Old American Standard says the Spirit Himself, maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And then verse 28 adds, And we know that all things work together for good for, to, to them that uh, love the Lord, uh, to them that are called according to His purpose. I think particularly this first section, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself maketh intercession for us. Uh, Brother B.J., would you like to comment on that? What role is the Holy Spirit playing in our prayer life? Certainly there is an emphasis here on what the Spirit does for us, but it does not address what He does to us. In fact, He does not have to do anything to me to do everything that this verse says He does. He does something for me that I'm incapable of doing as a human being to the degree that I would like to be able to uh, to do it, but the Spirit can make intercession for me with groanings which cannot be uttered, but certainly that doesn't mean He has to do something directly to me to accomplish this. And I think that's the number one thing that needs to be kept in mind. Okay. And this is something the Holy Spirit's doing in heaven. This is not uh, something He's doing to me or on the earth, but this is something that's taking place in heaven with regard to uh, my prayer life. Brother Colley, did you have any thoughts about this passage? Uh, yes, just one here. He says, for we know not how to pray as we ought. In other words, we need some direction on how to pray. The disciples came to the Lord and said, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And the Lord said, after this manner, therefore pray ye. And that was the Holy Spirit's declaration of what Jesus had said. He wasn't speaking of himself, but whatsoever he had heard. And he heard Jesus say, unto the Father, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and so forth. So he was teaching them the manner of prayer. And this says the Holy Spirit helps us to know how to pray. And that's where we get the teaching is from the Holy Spirit on how to pray. And he searcheth the hearts, knoweth what the mind of the Spirit is, all right. But he is one who helps us with our intercession okay. in knowing how to pray. That's and where our weakness is. When the person asks the question, maybe they have um, reference to an explanation of um, what does it mean that the Spirit's making intercession for us? He's Can, aiding us. That's okay. what it means, I think. Uh, he is aiding us in knowing how to pray. Yeah. Okay. And that's what I would say at any rate. Okay. Maybe Brother B.J. has a different thought on that. Well, even if one argues that it's something He is aiding us in doing in heaven, to the Father on our behalf, even if one argues that, that does not in any way, shape, or form give credence to the idea that He's doing something directly to our hearts, right. to us. It's not something He does to us. So whatever one's interpretation of this passage might be, the point is, as it relates to the question at hand, is does the Spirit do this to me uh, so that I know how to pray? in some sort of direct fashion. No, He's already revealed through the Word how to pray. Right. If there's more needed, He can certainly do that in heaven for me without doing it to me. Absolutely. Well said. I appreciate that. We have a comment that um, if anyone is interested, uh, Brother Camp's book that we've uh, referenced uh, several times already, 
Uh, his book, uh, it's called The Work of the Holy Spirit in Redemption by Franklin Camp. It is available uh, both on Amazon and also from Chula Vista Books if anyone is interested in uh, getting a copy of that. Okay, let's go back and see if we can answer some more of these questions. We only have uh, three or four minutes left in the program tonight. Let's see, uh, Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7, teaches that the Holy Spirit regenerates us and renews us. Can you explain exactly how this works? Uh, Brother Kyle, would you like to comment on that? Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7, teaches the Holy Spirit regenerates and renews us. What does that passage mean? Well, again, I believe all that the Holy Spirit does in our lives is through the Word of God. And if He does any rejuvenation, which I'm sure that He does, it's not works which are done in righteousness that we ourselves according, uh, have done, but it's according to His mercy that He saved us through the washing of regeneration. And, of course, that's baptism. All scholars of any repute at all say that's baptism right. and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So if you'll notice here, it's not by one thing, but by something else. It's not by works which we have done, but by baptism that we're saved that's right. by His mercy and by His grace. And so that's the way I would understand that. Uh, In fact, I, I think when a person comes to the understanding, the work of the Holy Spirit is that of being the revealer. That's right. Giving us the Word. When you can equate the Holy Spirit as the revealer of the Word, it helps you understand some passages. Again, Ephesians six seventeen that uh, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It makes some seemingly difficult passages go away, like John 3, 5. Uh, Jesus said, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot mm -hmm. enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the denominational world wants to say that that's something uh, mysterious, but when I understand the water there, referencing baptism, as you've mm -hmm. just stated, Correct. and then I have to be born of water, that is the uh, watery grave of baptism, Romans 6, 3, and 4, and of the Spirit, that is the, uh, the new life I get through obedience to the message revealed by the Holy Spirit. The passage becomes uh, much more clear to me. Your inspired commentary on that, Acts 8. The eunuch heard a message from the Holy Spirit, not directly, but through a preacher, and upon hearing Jesus preached through that preacher said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And he went on his way rejoicing. But how did he learn about what he needed to do to be able to go on his way rejoicing? The Holy Spirit through the preacher and then the water. Right, right. And 1 Corinthians 12, 13 makes that clear when he said, For by one Spirit were we all baptized into one body. In other words, by one Spirit's teaching, we were all baptized or born into the family of God. Absolutely. Well said. We only have, uh, we only have one minute left. Uh, I wish we had some more time to talk about this because I wanted to discuss some things where people cross the line. Uh, we've discussed that a little bit, but uh, there are certainly views that people have of the, di the direct guidance of the Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit speaking to them, and maybe this would be worthy of us even having another mm -hmm. uh, discussion on some time, but we've discussed the fact tonight the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a He, not an It. Uh, the Holy Spirit speaks to us and works through us through the Word today. And I appreciate to both of you, brethren, and your sound, solid stances and the wisdom that you have shared with us tonight. And we are glad that you have joined us here tonight uh, for GBN Live. It has been a great discussion. We hope you'll join us again next Thursday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, hopefully Mike Hickson will be back with us at that time. But until then, God bless and good night. This has been GBN Live. Thank you for watching.